statistical mathematical fact. Never has been down, has broken every single record. There is no asset that has come close. It's the only thing in the industry that was not touched, that was not hacked, and it never fails doing what it promised in 2009. It's never What's failed. What's the best performing asset the world has ever seen? And you'll find out. Hello, Bitcoiners. Bitcoin. Hello, traders. Hello, followers, supporters, haters, everyone. Surprise. Surprise. This is actually the first um, live spaces in a while that I've done in an impromptu fashion. No advance warning. I'm not really in the habit of, of doing my live spaces with a tremendous amount of forethought or even forewarning. So um, I guess it's just a matter of degree. I usually come on live with uh, advance warning anywhere between an hour to a few hours, but um, uh, never, never days in advance or anything like that. And that's not, that's not actually a bad idea. It's just that um, I tend to be better at communicating with you if it's off the cuff. I actually do very prep, very little preparation for any session that I do here with you. And I like it that way. I've um, uh, spoken about uh, financial freedom and things of that nature all over the world. And uh, anyone who's close to me in that world, they will tell you that I never prepare for any talk, any public speaking engagement of any kind. And I'm um, certainly not going to start planning that here. But anyway, I just um, had a little bit of time and wanted to come on with you and find out if any of you might be available to to shoot some questions my way. Um, I'd like to keep uh, our Q&A sessions uh, specifically focused on Bitcoin. Um, most of many of the people here might know my background in the financial space. Uh, I'm one of the pioneers in the direct access trading space. Having started my Wall Street career in 1986, um, I've been in the financial space for the last 43 years, actually, if you count the idiot year, starting from 1981. But as a professional since 1986, I've watched and witnessed and part, and I've actually participated in a lot of changes that's happened over uh, the last 40 years. And one of those changes has largely been the democratization of Wall Street. Uh, um, for lack of a better better phrase, uh, I've watched Wall Street go from basically being this inside crony, um, white glove wearing, um, elite dominated space to being somewhat more democratized uh, in the sense that today you and I from our cell phones and from a laptop computer, we can gain access to markets all over the world. And that was that was never the case that access to financial markets was reserved for the privileged, uh, for the white-gloved society. That's what I like to call them. And so that's been democratized. I've watched in my space um, prices for gaining access to that highway, that financial highway. Um, I've seen prices plummet from being extraordinarily high to practically free or nil. Um, there's nothing free on Wall Street entirely, but from a monetary cost basis, certainly close to free uh, today. And so I've seen a lot of things. I've seen the computerization, the computerization of Wall Street occur and have partake and 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 partook in that um, that evolution in the space. Uh, I've witnessed, um, and experienced and lived through the decimalization of Wall Street, where things used to happen in fractions, uh, creating um, a narrower and narrower space between buyer and seller, which is largely is partly responsible for the precipitous drop in cost on the part of every single individual that wants to access Wall Street. And so... Um, I've been in the financial arena for a very long time, and as uh, one of the pioneers in that space, having uh, built companies and sold them, um, 
having having run uh, one of uh, the United States' largest direct access brokerage firm, having sold that, having traveled around the world, um, uh, speaking to from one organization to the next about my experiences, which I continue to do today. Um, I've been in this space for, for a very long time, and my message about financial freedom has been at the core of my work for a very long time. Um, what changed um, quite dramatically in a way um, back in, I'd say, 19, uh, 2019 to, two, to, to 2020 um, was the fact that Bitcoin entered my life and it entered my life um, in a huge way uh, as a storm, if you will, that sort of cut through, car- clarified and captured a lot of the or a number of the eyes that were simply never dotted in my career um, and the T's that were never crossed in my career. It added a wholeness, a completeness um, to my life's work. And uh, um, about three years ago, I, I decided to dedicate a big portion of what I do every single day to not only deepening my knowledge and understanding about this incredibly special asset and what it has come to do for the human race, but to help others um, alongside them raise their level of knowledge, awareness, information, and sophistication about this asset as well. Uh, I continue to pound the table on one central fact, that we have an opportunity, in my opinion, that comes only once in a thousand years, maybe even longer. And I believe that each and every individual that's living today um, is living in a very unique time. They're living in a very special time, a time where billions upon billions of other human beings will never experience. I believe that the that the time where we can gain access to this special asset um, by simply a purchase, by simply an exchange for the current um, monetary units that are available to us today, like the dollar, the euro, and things of that nature. And we're living in a special time where with just a simple exchange of those monetary systems to this new monetary system is possible for us. And I don't believe that that's going to be possible forever. I believe that... Um, perhaps even in our lifetimes. In fact, I know, I believe with all my heart that it's going to happen in our lifetimes where you will not be able to purchase Bitcoin. And that's why I continue to pound the table on the fact that the window of opportunity is closing, that this window of opportunity will never be open again, that the, that your grand your grandkids, your great-grandkids will look at you in, in wonder, in amazement, that you were alive during a period in which you could simply buy it. But I believe that humans have not, we've been separated from scarcity so long that we've forgotten how to appreciate it, how to recognize it. Um, There was a time in the human experience where scarcity was our everyday life. Calories were scarce. Shelter was scarce. Life was scarce. Life was far more fragile thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years ago. Calories. Most people died by hunger. Most people died by violence from one clan group to another. Um, Shelter was scarce. Life was scarce. Um, Today, we don't experience scarcity on the same level, and we have lost touch with that. And Bitcoin has come back or come into our lives to reintroduce the power of scarcity. And because of its scarcity, I believe that it will become unavailable as far as being an item that one can purchase I believe that Bitcoin is always going to be something that is accessible to every human being on Earth. I believe that it will always be outside of the human purview. I I believe that it will always be untouchable in a way or unconfiscatable. I believe that it will be uncontrollable by human beings, but it will be accessible by all human beings, but not via purchase. 
And so we're still living in a time where you can literally purchase it. I believe that there's a future coming upon us for every single one listening to me speaking today. I believe that there's a point in our lives where the only way you'll gain access to Bitcoin is to deliver value to someone with Bitcoin. And you may have Bitcoin, but your life will be dependent on you gaining more Bitcoin. And this strikes a lot of people as being strange and odd, but it's not really strange and odd because that's what you do right now for the US dollar or the euro or the Japanese yen or the Argentinian peso. You wake up every single day and you dedicate the vast majority of your lives, your life to giving value in exchange for someone else's coupon. But that coupon, that piece of paper that you're giving your life for is in the control of a human being. It's in the control of a small group of human beings who not only control the issuance of that piece of paper, they control the value, they control the price, and they control the supply. And no man should be able to control what you work for. And that's what Bitcoin has come to deliver. And so the time in which we're able to take a shitty piece of paper that is in the control of a small group of very privileged men, the time where people will accept the shitty piece of paper for Bitcoin is coming to an end. And so it is my message that we have to do everything in our power, every moment of our existence until this, win until this window is shut closed forever, to do everything we possibly can to convert the shitty piece of paper to what is real, what is outside human control that is um, everlasting, that is mathematically designed to not only retain the value and the energy that we've swapped into it, but to actually mathematically increase it every single four years of our lives forever and beyond if we pass it onward. And so I know that the vast majority of people that I come in contact with have not Re, do not really see Bitcoin in this fashion. They see it as just another financial instrument that's something that has been created by some other human being that, okay, it's now becoming another asset class, but it's just another tiny asset class within a mix of other asset classes. And that is missing the mark. The root definition or the root meaning behind the word sin is... The root meaning, if you were to look up the word sin and go to its root, the true meaning of a sin is to miss the mark, as an archer would miss the bullseye. And I believe that that is an outright sin, to view Bitcoin as just another thing, another small item within a mix of items. Because this is completely outside of that mix of items. This is completely outside of human beings. This was not created by a human being, despite the fact that I get a lot of flack for that view. This was not created by a human being. This was not brought into existence by a human being. This is not run by a human being. This is not controlled by a human being. This can't be manipulated by a human being. Its supply is not in the hands of, the, of a human being. Its issuance is not in the hand of a, of a human being. And nothing about it is in the hands of a human being. And therein lies its ability to be reliable. You see, the, the uncertainty that we live with in a, in, within life today is because human beings have historically been in control of everything. And the most uncertain item on planet Earth is a human being. And if you need any proof, if you need any proof that that is true, all you need look at is all you need to do is look at every single human being that you ever had in your life. Every human being has failed you at one point or another. Every single human being has failed you in one way or another, whether it's your children, whether it's your parents, whether it's your employer, whether it's your friends, whether it's your relatives, whether it's your freaking neighbors, every single human being has failed you. Every single human being is unreliable. Every single human being, if they haven't failed you yet, it's just a matter 
of time. And up until this point, everything that we've had to trust was in the hands of a human being. Every asset that we had to give our life to was in the hands of a human being. And for the first time in the human experience, we can put our faith, we can put our work, we can put our energy, we can put our lives into something that human beings can't fuck up. And that's Bitcoin. Anyway, guys, I like to always start every single talk with this impromptu monologue. That's my impromptu monologue. I never know what I'm going to talk about or say during that monologue. It just sort of comes from the cuff. But um, talk to me, guys. What do you want to talk to about today? I've got a little bit of time. Let's do this. This is very reminiscent, guys, of um, when I used to have these midnight talks on Periscope. Um, I really liked Periscope. And um, most of you may not even know what it was, but it was an earlier version of, I guess, Twitter spaces in a way, in video form. And uh, Twitter uh, ultimately bought Periscope out um, and uh, and then basically shelved it after, after a short period of time. But for the most part, it was really cool. I'd come out, on, I'd come out and um, do these... Uh, talks um, long before I got into Bitcoin, uh, largely about trading and financial markets and things of that nature, and my philosophical views about about money and um, wealth and things of that nature. And uh, I built quite a bit and quite quite a decent audience on Periscope at that time. I think we had something like thirty thousand people um, on my Periscope channel, and uh, it was really a cool time. To this very day, I get hundreds of people that ask Oliver, "Can we bring back the?" Periscope sessions. And so Periscope's gone for the most part, but um, uh, it has been replaced by by these live spaces. But um, yeah, this is the closest thing to my old Periscope talks. All right. Uh, I see a question come through from Calvin. Calvin's uh, been with me for quite some time. Good to see you, Calvin. Uh, always can rely on you to shoot something out there. Uh, Calvin's question is, um, Oliver, outside of the normal scheduled Bitcoin cycle, can you foresee three catalysts that can put Bitcoin ahead of fiat, the fiat price schedule or even behind schedule? Of course, I believe until history proves otherwise, the behind schedule might require a black swan event. So, um, Calvin, what I think that you're asking is you're asking about a fiat USD denominated price. Is there something that based on historical cycles, I can see that can affect what has happened in the past? Um, something that is different this time that can cause the historical cycle to be different to the upside in one way or subdued to the downside in, in some way. And the answer is, the answer is yes. Historically, well, first of all, it's important to understand that Bitcoin's cycle is made up of four years. These, these four-year cycles can should be viewed in a sense um, in terms of leap years. Bitcoin doesn't really have an annual birthday the way we have a birthday. It has a birthday every four years as if it were born on um, leap year. Um, born on the day, the February 29th, which is leap year. Uh, technically, there's only February the 29th every four years. So Bitcoin's having or having, you pick the term, is Bitcoin's birthday. And so everything that happens in between these birthdays, people, is nothing more than noise. Even the U.S. dollar price is noise. So between these four-year birthdays, Bitcoin will vacillate to the upside. It will crash to the downside. It will rise exponentially to the upside. But even in both directions, even from a U.S. dollar's perspective, that's noise. Because the only real USD dollar denominated price that matters is its birthday price. And if you were to go back over all of Bitcoin's birthdays, what you would see on its, on its initial birth is zero. 
All right, that's what you'd see. And on its first birthday, you would see a price of $12. And so from zero to $12 was its first birthday. Its second birthday, it moved from $12 on the last birthday to its next birthday. It moved to $653. That was its from that was its second birthday after its birth. So listen to me carefully. It was born at zero. Its first birthday was at twelve twelve dollars. Its second birthday was at six hundred and fifty three dollars. Its third birthday, which happened in um, May of twenty twenty, was at eight thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars. Now we're coming upon Bitcoin's. Uh, fourth birthday, which is slated to happen around, believe it or not, April 20th so far. That could change a bit. But April 20th, April 21st of April, and we're already in the 40,000s. So I want you to think about the trajectory of its birthdays. Zero, $12, $653, $8,500, and now, wherever it's going to be in April, maybe that's $52, maybe that's $55, maybe that's $80,000. Right now, we're at 43 a little less, a little more, whatever it is. And these are exponential jumps every single birthday. Now, what, what traps most people is that they get mired in the noise between its birthdays. But Bitcoin is screaming to you to ignore the noise and just focus on my birthdays. If you can give me four years of your life, I promise you, it says, if you were to personify it, I promise you, I'll take care of you on my birthday every four years. You see, you can give four years to a rinky-dink college and you still start off at negative there are people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars gaining a college degree. They start off negative because they're mired in debt after they have taken out loans to finish the university college. Bitcoin says you won't, not only will you not start off negative, not only will you start off flat, you're going to start off exponentially higher than the day you start with me. And so Bitcoin wants you to give it four years. Now, what um, a minimum of four years. Now, what what Calvin is saying is that um, what we have seen is that despite the fact that there's been this meteoric rise from birthday to birthday, is there something that can change that? Is there something, is there a catalyst that might break that pattern? And my belief is to the downside, no. You see, Bitcoin is mathematically designed to become more valuable every four years through its having. If the scarcity of the asset was valued at 8,000 last birthday, it just, by cutting its issuance in half, it makes the value of itself more scarce and therefore more valuable than the $8,568 from the last birthday. So it makes itself more valuable every four years on its birthday. And But what I do see as a change, what I see as a change is to the upside. And so there are people who have said that Bitcoin has experienced diminishing returns from birthday to birthday because from zero to 12 is an astronomical percentage gain, but it is more, but the, 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 the birthday from 12 to 653 was less than the birthday from zero to two. I mean, zero to 12 and the birthday from 653 from a percentage basis was less than from 653 to 8,568 was less than the prior birthday. So every birthday's gain is less. While that statistically might be true, but what I think 
needs to be understood is that Bitcoin has experienced all of these former birthday gains with simply its having to work with. So it has the supply, it has always had the supply side to make itself more valuable. It's never had the demand side. You see, Bitcoin has become the best performing asset the world has ever known. It's become the 10th most valuable asset the world has ever experienced or had access to. 10th in the world in 15 years. It's become the 16th most valuable currency in the world. It's done that with one leg. It's done that with one leg, not two legs. It's one leg. It's done that only by being able to have itself in half, its issuance in half. It's never had the demand side. And people say, people say, well, Oliver, that's not true. There has to always be demand. Not really, because you can't say that half of 1% is demand. Half of 1% of the world has adopted Bitcoin. Half of 1% of all human beings hold Bitcoin today. You can't say that that's demand. Okay, if 40, if you went from zero to 40%, that's an explosive demand. But half of 1%? Half of one, not one percent, half of one percent in 15 years, there's no demand. So Bitcoin outstripped everything the world has ever known with one leg supply. It had the ability to affect its supply. Now, what's the catalyst that can snap this pattern of seemingly um diminishing returns it's the demand side today we're starting a brand new era an era that bitcoin has never experienced we're starting the era of demand being added to the equation bitcoin is allowed to stop hopping on one freaking foot and it's allowed now to put its second foot down and say now i can run and I am not one of these Bitcoiners who believes in the continuance of diminishing returns. I believe that's just the first part of its first S curve. And if you were to draw an S, you know that the middle part of an S slopes a little bit until it just swishes into its accelerated upper part of the S. And I think that now it's time for the swoosh to the upside because Bitcoin is putting its second leg down. It now has the demand side. It now has countries coming into it. It now has institutions joining the game, spot ETFs and things of that nature. You have nation states starting to mine Bitcoin. You have China just intro just announced it's going to have a spot Bitcoin ETF. That's on the heels of Hong Kong saying it's going to have a spot Bitcoin ETF. The demand side is here. And I believe that now, for the first time going forward, having both the supply side, the having that happens every four years, and constant demand that's going to grow that 0.5% to 1%, then 3%, then 5%, then 8%, then 10%, then 15%, then 20 then 40 then 50 then 60 My God, the gains that we've seen with no demand are impressive enough because they've been enough to be number one so by such a large margin that no one even includes it in the ranking because it's too embarrassing to include Bitcoin beside you. That I believe that it's going to make that performance yeah. record look like child's play. I get a lot of pushback on this view, but how can it not? How can it not when what it's accomplished so far is without demand. So when you ask me, Calvin, do I see a catalyst that can snap the pattern that's been going on over the last several cycles? Yes, it's now demand. Demand is going to snap this seemingly um, sequence of diminishing returns every birthday. I believe that we're going to see now a series of birthdays that get bigger and bigger every four years. 
bigger than they were before. Because now, here comes demand. All right. That's my view, guys. And guess what? I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else here? What else we got here? Uh, uh, North Star has a question here. Oliver, quick thought experiment. Uh, if you were 22 to 30 with no family, would you go 100% allocated to Bitcoin? What are some of the considerations? Um, I'll take you one step further. And this is something else that I get a lot of pushback, especially being in my industry, coming from my industry. I believe that there's no reason why everyone can't be 100% Bitcoin. I know that's going to strike many people like a very annoying bad note. It's going to seem almost like a sacrilege, again, especially coming from someone in my industry. But I want you to think about this for a second. You are 100% the U.S. dollar. Everything you do in your life is to make dollars. Think about that. You're 100% dollar. And so Bitcoin is the replacement, is the superior replacement of the dollar, which in a sense means that if you're smart, you'll switch your unit from the inferior to the superior. And so if the dollar which you dedicate your entire life for, you go to work for it, you, you think about it all day long, you price things in it all day long. All of your goals are associated with more dollars. You get educated to make more dollars. You try to get more skill to make more dollars. You invest in yourself to do what? To make more dollars. You try to seek privilege and acceptance by having more dollars. Your whole life is 100% dollars. And your whole life is for something that is mathematically designed to go down in value your whole life. The dollar has lost 98.9% of its value since 1913. And it's not stopping. It will continue to trend towards zero forever as long as it exists. It won't last forever, but until it exists, it will be in a straight trend to the downside. And they tell you this in your face. They tell you that we seek to have a 2% inflation rate. That's a tricky term. But if you look at the term correctly, they're saying we're going to make it go down in value every two every year by 2%. Inflation is just a fancy word for we're going to make it less valuable by 2% every single year of your life so that you will have to work 2% harder to get the same thing every single year of your life. So life will get harder for you every year until you die. And this is what you give your life for. And Bitcoin says every four years, I am going to make you more than you are. I'm going to make you more valuable. I'm going to make you wealthier. I'm going to make you worth more. And so when you put these two things side, side by side together, which one should you give your life to? The thing that's controlled by other men who are on purpose making you have to run on the, the hamster wheel 2% faster every single year. And we know the 2% is a lie. You're really running 7, 8, 9, 10% faster every year to buy the same hamburger, to buy the same dinner, to buy the same movie with your wife, with your family, with your kids. You have to run faster every single year until you die. You're going to die exhausted. You're going to die spent giving your life for, th for this thing. 
And here we have an option. We can opt out of that for something that does exactly the opposite. So why should, if you're 100% for the loser and you now have the winner, why would you not be 100% for the winner? Why would you diversify that? No, I'm going to keep a portion of the loser and, and, and go for the winner. I've never been a strong proponent of diversification. Anyone who's known my trading history, there are books written about my trading accomplishments on Wall Street. Not my books. I've written five books in five different languages. I'm not talking about my books. I'm talking about books written about my trading, about me. And if you know anything about my work, I've never promoted diversification. I've, div I've promoted concentration. And so that is not different with Bitcoin at all. I think that the percentage of your life, and let's say your financial life, that's really not true, but that's what's more commonly understood your financial life let's split it because there it's all inextricably intertwined with your life money is your life but let's take it apart even though it shouldn't be apart and let's look at your financial life your financial life um shoot i lost my thought oh I believe that the percentage of your financial life that's in Bitcoin is in direct correlation to your is in di direct correlation to the percentage or the level of your financial intelligence. When you understand money, the more you understand money and how the financial system is designed to enslave you, the higher the percentage you are with your Bitcoin holdings. And so if you've got a very small percentage of your financial life in Bitcoin, that is directly tied to, I know the level of sophistication you are with money and understanding how the financial system works. So if it's 2%, if you got 2% of your financial life in Bitcoin, you're a two percenter regarding money and the financial system as a whole. You know very little about it. Because if you did, if you really knew what it was, if you had really lift the curtain and peered behind it, that percentage would be way up there. And so we're moving to a world where everything's going to be 100% Bitcoin anyway. That is my view. And those who get it first are going to be 100% faster than others. And as a result of being moving toward 100% faster, they're going to have more. Their future is going to be bigger. Their family lineage is going to be more elite. Guys, Bitcoin's not going to erase. I don't even like to use the term inequality. It's not going to erase grade levels. You understand? It's it, it nothing nothing is going to erase levels. There will always just be people that are brighter. There will always be people that are more capable. And that capability and that level of intelligence is going to be directly reflected by the level of Bitcoin that you have. So the people that get to that get this faster will have more Bitcoin. In the future, when there is only Bitcoin. Some people feel that I shouldn't say this, but mark my words, Bitcoin will be the world reserve currency. You're going to price everything in Bitcoin. 
And he or she who has Bitcoin will be able to gain access to anything on planet Earth that the little heart desires. That's where we're going. Everything is pointing there. The dollar's collapsing and Bitcoin's rising against the dollar. Everything is collapsing against Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the only thing in existence that's rising. You want to put me to the test? Then price everything in Bitcoin and see what the chart looks like. Price real estate in Bitcoin. It's a straight shit coin to the downside. Price stocks in Bitcoin, the NASDAQ or the S&P in Bitcoin. The price is straight to the downside. Price the dollar in Bitcoin is straight to the downside. Price any fiat currency straight to the downside. Price any asset that you can think of on planet Earth against Bitcoin, and everything is trending towards zero against Bitcoin. So you don't think that Bitcoin's going to take can take out everything? You don't think that over time people are going to realize, wait a minute, if I hold the dollar versus the Bitcoin, I lose. If I hold Bitcoin versus the dollar, I win. They're going to start switching more over from the dollar to Bitcoin. Then they're going to start saying, well, you know what? If I hold stocks, there's a certain performance here. But if I hold Bitcoin, there's a much bigger performance here. Stocks are trending downward in Bitcoin. I'm going to start switching a portion of what I have in stocks to Bitcoin. I'm going to start switching a portion of what I have in real estate to Bitcoin. I'm going to start switching a portion of what I keep in cash to Bitcoin. You don't think that's going to happen? You think I'm the first and the last? You think I'm the first one to do this? You think I'm going to be the last one to do this? The numbers of Oliver Velez's are only going to grow. Do you understand? I took the vast majority of all the wealth I had in certain things over decades, guys. Let me run through a small handful of the biggest ones. My first major investment was made in Eli Lilly back in 1981. Okay? Eli Lilly. I held it. Guess what? Until until 2023. From 1981 to 2023, and I added to it every single month of my life. My kids' trust funds were adding to it every single month of its existence. Retirement funds in Eli Lilly every single month. Microsoft was my next big major, well, there was McDonald's, but I can't really say that was as big as these. But McDonald's came in 86. Microsoft came in 1994. Apple came in 1997. Amazon came in 2003. Gold came in a big way in two, uh, January 2005. NVIDIA came in 2010. Meta, formerly known as Facebook, came the year of their, I, can't, I always get this year mixed up, 2013, 14, I can't remember. Anyway, the point I'm trying to say is that these were mega wealth plays for me, things that I didn't sell, I just added to. And the vast majority, oh, the vast majority of it, guess where it is today? It's in Bitcoin. If I if I price all of those things have done marvelously well, just look at a just look at a chart of Eli Lilly from 1981. Look at a chart of Microsoft. Microsoft's battling Apple for the, the most valuable company in the world. I've got the two most valuable companies in the world. I've had them from the 90s. There are people that might even be listening to me here that were with me in the 90s doing this with me. I brought thousands of people with me in Amazon in 2003, thousands in gold and with me in gold when the gold spot ETF got approved in late 2004. We piled in in January of 2005. I brought thousands of people with me in these plays. NVIDIA, I brought five, no, no, that was a smaller group. I brought 500 plus people with me in NVIDIA in 2010. And people are screaming about NVIDIA now, making all time new highs. Look at it from 2010. And these are things that I taught the people who came with me. You don't sell these things. We didn't sell Apple. 
We didn't sell Amazon. We didn't sell Microsoft. We didn't sell NVIDIA from 2010. Guess where the vast majority of that went to? Guess where all of my gold went to? It went to Bitcoin. Now I ask you, you think I'm the only one to have done that? You think I'm the last one to do it? To see that if I take all of those things, which everyone would, their jaw would drop at the gains in these things. But when you put those against Bitcoin, they look like shit coins. How can I ignore that? How can I ignore the fact that they look, they're losers against Bitcoin? They lose value. That If I hold Apple instead of Bitcoin, I'm losing. If I hold Microsoft instead of Bitcoin, I'm losing. If I have a bunch of... Re- I went down to eight properties. I had a lot more than eight properties. I'm down to actually seven properties now. Where do you think that went to? These things were stores of value to me, right? But they, if I hold them, I'm losing by not holding Bitcoin instead. And in my business, that's not what you do. Your, my whole purpose as a financial expert is to find what is performing better than everything else and to, and to switch as much to that as I possibly can. That's my whole, that's been my whole job in a nutshell. Whether that's over, and a lot of people say, Oliver, you're known for 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 short-term oriented trading. Well, okay, a short-term or a short-term period of time in trading is nothing more than a microcosmic version of the long term. So even in the short-term period of time, my job was to find what's rising faster than everything else and to jump on board that, whether that was over a 16-minute period or a 30-minute period. What's outperforming everything in this small period of time. So just stretch that to a decade or two decades or three decades. And whether it's micro or macro, that's always the job. And so when you discover what is outperforming everything, you realize that if you don't switch to that, you are a loser by holding something else. And I am telling you, Increasingly, every day, every week, every month, there's a new Oliver. There's a new Michael Saylor. In in different degrees, maybe, but a new Michael Saylor, a new Oliver, a new Tim Draper. Do you understand? A new a new Drucken Miller, a new Paul Tudor Jones. And soon there'll be more Larry Finks, because I do believe Larry Fink is truly orange-pilled. It's just, it's going to happen day by day, week by week. People are going to see this. These people are not dumb. I'm not dumb. When I saw it, I knew what I had to do. They're going to do the same You can't just see this and not do that. And eventually, all of it's going to go there. Almost all of it. All of it. The same way everything is in the U.S. dollar now, everything, everything is denominated in U.S. dollars. Everything is going to being denominated in Bitcoin. Because it's just better. And you can't Better can't, can, it, you can't prevent it from being adopted. You can't. It cannot be stopped. This wave cannot stop. You're not going down from 0.5% people. If 0.5% of, of, if zero. 0.5%, half of 1% got us to 43,000. The 0.5% is not going backwards. It's going to 1%. Then it's going to 
then it's going to 6%. It's not going the other way. And if you've already seen what it's done with half of 1%, there are two things that should pop in your mind instantly. I'm still early because we're at only half of 1%, so I'm still super early. I can't let unit price fool me. And the second thing is, I better start shoveling as much as I have in this other broken stuff into this. And if Oliver's right, that I won't be able to shovel it into Bitcoin forever. I better start shoveling hard and I better start shoveling fast. You're not going to be able to swap into Bitcoin forever. I'm telling you, because more Olivers are being born in this space every day. I won't take your dollars for my Bitcoin. So how can you swap your dollars for my Bitcoin? You can't. I will never take that. I won't. I'm swapping dollars for Bitcoin. I'm going to take your dollars from my Bitcoin. I did that. I changed it to Bitcoin already. I changed it to the superior item. Now I'm going to flip it back to the inferior item. Your dollars are not welcome, people. And Olivers are being born every day. Every day, there's someone new that says, I'm not taking dollars for this anymore. And that is going to freaking explode all over the world. People in Nigeria are going to say, I'm not taking the Nigerian, I forget what they call the currency, whatever. Nair, I'm not taking that for Bitcoin. People in China are going to say, I'm not taking the renminbi for Bitcoin anymore. People in Argentina are going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not swapping my Bitcoin for this shitty piece of piece of paper you call the peso anymore. People have already done that in Venezuela. I'm not taking boulevards for my Bitcoin. It is going to happen all over the world. And when the world stops accepting paper for the superior item called Bitcoin, you're not going to be able to buy it. The only way is you're going to have to come to a Bitcoiner with Bitcoin and you better offer them something extraordinarily special. You better give them something so wow, so out of this world to let them give up all the opportunity that this is going to give them in the future for Ever. They're going to have to, they're only going to let it go. They're only going to let that future go. If you come to them correctly, you're going to have to work for a Bitcoiner. You're going to be a Bitcoiner too. So Bitcoiners are going to have to work for you too. But for what you need, you're going to have to go to a Bitcoiner that has what you need. And you're going to have to go to them with something very special. And it ain't going to be some dollar with a freaking dead president on it. I promise you that. And so your window of opportunity to get this thing and keep it is not, it's not going to be open very long. These ETFs are here to price you out of your future. They're not here to bring the price down these bozos out here saying, oh, well, the ETFs, that's an attack on Bitcoin. It is an attack on Bitcoin, but you're thinking the wrong way. The attack is to take it away from you and bring it to zero doesn't take it away from you. Bring it back to a thousand doesn't bring it, take it away from you, does it? Bringing it back to 500 doesn't take Bitcoin away from you, does it? It makes it more available to you. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to take it away from you. You're going to be outpriced. They're going to snatch this thing from you. They're going to trick you into accepting dollars for your Bitcoin. 
They're going to keep the Bitcoin and they're going to drive this thing to prices that your little mind can barely wrap itself around. I've spoken about this. When you want to remove the masses from something, you don't make it more available. You make it less available. If you don't want riffraff in your neighborhood, what do you do with the neighborhood? You raise the prices of all the houses in the neighborhood. You make it exclusive so riffraff can't have access to it. You don't make the houses less valuable. If you want the riffraff out, you make it more valuable. The attack is on, but it's in the other way. They're going to take this away from you. They're going to teach you that you shouldn't hold it. Let us hold it for you, ETF. We don't want you holding. We want to hold it. We'll give you dollars for it. If you ask for Bitcoin from us, we're not going to give you Bitcoin. We'll give you dollars that go down every single year of of its existence, but we're keeping the Bitcoin. So they're going to trick you into accepting the paper for it while they retain the real thing. And they're going to keep moving the price on you away from you. Further and further away from you. They're going to price you out. And you will spend in this lifetime, you're going to spend the final years of your life regretting the day, regretting this day that I'm speaking to you, that you did not act. And I believe that with every fiber of my being and every ounce of blood that's pumping through my veins, you will die in regret. That is how I see this. (laughs) Sorry for being so passionate, guys. It's like, I can't shut up about this. Like, when you see it, you just see it, you know? Edder says, uh, currently every asset is failing against Bitcoin in fiat terms. That's right. But if we evaluate all in Bitcoin terms, is there a possibility that companies that built its foundation on top of Bitcoin will offer a profit or outperformance in Bitcoin terms? That's a great question, Edder. Will there be opportunities that outpace Bitcoin? Yes. 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 So, guys, I want you to think about this. There, money evolves in four stages. All sound money has evolved in four stages. First, it's a collectible. I've gone over this before. So it starts off very niche, something that only a few people recognize or appreciate. It's a trinket. Bitcoin was a trinket for years. Computer geeks and people that wanted to use it to get things that were supposedly illegal and things of that nature. Um, computer science, uh, cryptographers, the cypherpunks, mathematicians, but very niche. Most people would look at it and be like, are you kidding me? So it was only recognizable as something interesting or valuable to a very small group of people. But that collectible stage, as it grows, it starts to catch a continued value. And then it starts to attract another type of person that's not interested in it for the reasons that the collector was interested in it. They start to become interested in it because they see that it retains value and actually increases value. 
So then a new group of participant comes in and becomes interested in it, not from a computer geek's perspective, not from a cypher, cypher, cypherpunk's perspective, not from someone who wants to use it for illegal purposes, not from for computer science, not from a mathematical point of view. They see value in its retention of value. And that starts a brand new phase called the store of value phase. And phases are created by the nature of the of the people holding it. So this new nature of person creates a new the new nature of the new phase. I'm storing this, I'm saving this, I'm socking this away. That's the store of value phase. The store of value phase is the most exponential number go up phase of a money. And we have just begun the store of value phase. We're just exiting. They overlap, understand, but we're exiting the trinket phase. And we've just begun the store of value phase. Every player that the EFTs are bringing in are store of value. They're not trinket. They're not trinket phase. They don't give a fuck about the cipher punks ethos they don't care about its mathematical beauty at this particular point and it does have that it's just it's a store value it's better than holding dollars and so this new store of value phase is going to kick off if history is any guide and it's the only guide we have so it is a guide it's going to kick off the the most exponential number go up period of the entire four stages. The second phase is the big one. My traders will tell you that that is a common theme throughout all of finance. The second leg is the big one, not the first one. Look at Apple's first leg. It was big, but look at its freaking second leg, right? Oh my God. The second leg is always the big one. So we're now entering the second leg of Bitcoin. If you think the first leg was big, OMG, you ain't seen nothing yet, yet, buddy. So we've just entered the second phase, store value. Store value is what is where your biggest portion, the biggest part of adoption comes in. Or, a, or adoption starts to explode. So we're now entering store value with half of 1% of the world having it. This phase, store value phase, is going to explode that number. And it's going to grow exponentially every single year. You will see this. And as a larger and larger and larger portion of the population of the human race has some portion of Bitcoin stored, it naturally starts to be something that people start trading amongst themselves with. And then we start to begin a burgeoning medium of exchange where you say, I'm not taking dollars for this, but I'll take Satoshi's for it. I, I like that Mustang that, that I like that 69 Mustang you have. Uh, all right, cool. I like it too, but uh, are you selling it? Yes, for sale. Um, how much is it worth? Um, give me one and a half Bitcoin for it. And people are going to start saying, I'm not taking dollars for it, but I'll take Bitcoin for it. And as more and more people start to do that, when you are almost guaranteed that the other person has Bitcoin, we're not there yet. Most people you meet in the street don't have Bitcoin, but we're going to get to a place in the store of value adoption phase where you can guarantee that every single person you see walking down a crowded street has Bitcoin. Every single human being has Bitcoin. And at that point, you're going to know that you can deal with them in Bitcoin. And that's what starts the medium of exchange. And it's the shitcoin narrative that wants to jump straight to medium of exchange before anybody has it. That's a shitcoin narrative. You can't cheat this process. You can't be a viable medium of exchange before you have spent an inordinate amount of time as a, as a, as a store of value. 
Bitcoin is going through the proper stages the right way. It is not cheating the process by trying to become the third stage before it's even any stage at all. It's stupid. And that's why they're all scams in my book. They're trying to leapfrog the process and they're selling this to you and it can't ever work because you have to go through these stages to be a sound money. And then after peop- after enough people start saying, give me a, a Bitcoin and a half, give me 2 million Satoshis for it, give me 150,000 Satoshis for it. As more and more people get used to valuing things in Satoshis and Bitcoin, no one's, fewer and fewer people are going to value it anything else. And then it becomes naturally a unit of account for the world. And these are the four stages. Now, I know I'm going about this circuitous route to answer Edgar's question here. Um, but that was necessary for me to lay that foundation before trying to answer it. So his question was, is there a possibility that companies built on top of Bitcoin have the potential to outperform Bitcoin? And the answer is yes, but probably not The answer is yes, but the it's going to be tough for that to happen consistently in the store of value phase, because as I mentioned, that's the biggest number go up phase of a money's evolutionary process. It is when it starts to become a medium of exchange that it tapers, the number go up begins to taper, and that's when things on top of Bitcoin can potentially consistently outperform it. But we're a long way off from Bitcoin being a viable medium of exchange because it needs to be get to the place where almost everyone you see walking down the street has Bitcoin. We're a long way off from that. And thank God, because we don't want medium of exchange coming too fast to taper the price to taper its its meteoric ascent. We need to hold this and hoard this. That's where the price gain comes from. It doesn't come from using it to buy burgers and milkshakes and hot dogs and filling up your gas tank. It comes from holding it. And so at that point, the companies that have tied themselves into Bitcoin can potentially consistently outperform its value increase. Now, if you think about the evolutionary process of this, there was a time where companies, it was rare for a company to be a million dollar company. You got to go back where that was. You went back to the 1600s, 1700s. There weren't really million dollar companies, rare. And then we went to a level where there were $10 million companies, rare, but the first one happened and then the second one happened. And then $100 million companies, right? And then a billion dollar companies. You see, when I was a kid, there were no billion dollar, there weren't many billion dollar companies. There were few. Now, billion dollars, you start off as a company of billion dollars. And you go public at billions of dollars today. And now we have trillion dollar companies. But what brought about trillion dollar companies? The companies that tied themselves into the internet. The internet was the first phase of Bitcoin. Understand that. That Bitcoin is a continuance of what the internet started. The companies that decided to plug their whole business into the internet. They're the trillion dollar companies today. 
There are no trillion dollar companies that have not done that. Maybe there's one oil company, but you know what I'm saying. The majority of your trillion dollar companies tied themselves into an open protocol that is not owned by anyone. Sound familiar? They're the trillion dollar companies. The $10 trillion companies, that's the next level, are the companies that decide to tie themselves into the next thing, which is Bitcoin, to tie their whole business, their whole way of life into the Bitcoin network. They're the next $10 trillion companies. So we went from the first million dollar companies to the first ten trillion dollar, ten million dollar companies to the first one hundred million dollar companies to the first billion dollar companies to the first ten billion dollar companies to the first one hundred billion dollar companies to the to now we're at the stage of the first trillion dollar companies and Bitcoin brings about the next ten trillion dollar companies. But it's a ways off. Now, what I do, um, what I teach my traders to do is we do do some artful things with the offshoots of Bitcoin, with microstrategy. Um, we're chomping at the bit for um, a very um, uh, liquid options market to be built on top of the ETFs. We're chomping at the bit with that because these bring in some really amazing tools to add to your Bitcoin stack. And we can't wait to get our hands around options on the ETFs. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have our Bitcoin stack but we're going to turn our Bitcoin stack into an income generator through options. We're going to use options to hedge some of our gains. And these things, I think, are appropriate, but only for people who are somewhat professional and know what they're doing. The average person should not be doing things like that. They should just be stacking. Uh, Bart's asking, uh, Oliver, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the rise in transaction fees. Um, I know there are strategies like using lightning channels, consolidating UTXOs, etc. But the rise is a curious thing, and it seems like it will only get worse. Absolutely, it's going to get worse, and you want it to get worse. Guys, um, there are always trade-offs to everything in life. It's just the way the universe is structured. Um, if you want one side of a of a seesaw to rise, you have to push the other side down. If you want to in a bow and arrow, if you want your arrow to propel forward, you have to pull it backwards. There's always this balance in life. And so that means there's always a trade-off. Something has to go back in order for something to go forward. It's just a universal law, right? That's the universe we're part of, and we have to deal with that. There are trade-offs to higher fees on the base layer, but understand that you want the base layer to be expensive to transact. You want that. You don't want your base layer moving like a freaking feather. I want you to think about a pyramid. What's Where is the pyramid the strongest? Where is its least movable part? At the bottom, right? Your table. Where is the most secure part of a table? At the base, right? What's the most powerful part of a tree? At the trunk level, right? At the bottom, right? Its roots, right? Where are you the most stable? Through your legs. At the bottom of your body. So think of... Bitcoin is a layered system at the bottom, at the base layer. You don't want it very movable. You don't want it easily pushed around. Its power is in its immobility at the 
base layer. And where all of these shit coins go wrong is that they're trying to do everything on the base layer. It's stupid. You don't, you don't, you don't do minor things with your legs that you would do with your arms. Like you don't, you know, you don't pick your freaking nose with your knee. You don't put a, a spoonful of food in your mouth with your feet. Well, some people do. Some people have to. But you know what I'm saying. Your base is used for certain things. Your limbs at the top of your body are used for another thing. So what's the base layer of money should not be movable and it should be expensive to move. A higher layer should be faster and should be easier and cheaper to move. So a second layer is cheaper and faster than layer one. A layer on top of the second layer, layer three, is even faster and cheaper than layer two. And each layer has a specialty. Do you understand? And so just because we're early with the with Bitcoin building through all of its layers, we only really kind of are familiar with layer one. And we think we're supposed to be transacting by buying burgers and french fries at the layer base layer at the base layer and that's not what it's for it's supposed to be that's going to move major value on the base layer major transactions at the base layer so i want you to think of this layered money system like your money some of you ha may have a vault this vault might be in a bank it might be in your house. If you're well-to-do, some of you might have a very secure vault built into your home where you keep the highest things of value there. And this is where the vast majority of your wealth is. Your entire worth is in this vault. You save it there. You store it there your jewels, your this and that, right? On a layer above the vault is, let's say that layer is your checking account. So you got the vault, then you've got the checking account. Now, you won't use the checking account the same way you use the vault. You're not going to go into the vault to buy some Oreo cookies. You're not even going to go to the checking account to buy some cookies. So let's say the layers are your vault. You've got a money market fund, like a savings account. Then you've got the checking account on top of the money market fund. So you got the money market fund is for cash reserves for emergency. You got the vault for the vast majority of your wealth. You've got the money market level for maybe you've got a few thousand dollars in that for emergencies that you don't touch. That's for an emergency. You got six months worth of pay in the money market or a year worth of pay in the money market, and you don't touch that. Then you've got the checking account, which you don't touch on a day-to-day -day basis. You use the checking account for monthly bills. And then you've got the credit card level on top of the checking level where you use for every day. Debit card, cherry card, you use to fill your gas tank up. You might use it at the shop for groceries that week or whatever. That's another higher level. And then you've got cash in your pocket. That's an even higher level. So what's the fastest one, the cash in your pocket? So the cash and the credit card levels are the fastest. Do you understand? What's, the, what's a slower level, but still okay? The checking account level. It's going to take days to clear. You understand? And so the money, so Bitcoin is like that. It's building itself from the vault. You've got shit coins that want to build itself from the cash level. That's dumb. Or the credit card level. That's stupid. You don't build a house from the rooftop. You build it from the freaking foundation. Bitcoin is being built from the 
vault level, which is the foundation. And people want to treat the vault level like it's the cash in their pocket. That is dumb. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of how money works. Money happens in layers. It's not everything on one layer. You don't even operate your money, everything on one layer. And so when you say, well, well, Bitcoin doesn't have these layers. Thank God it doesn't have these layers because when it has all those layers, you've already missed the opportunity, Bozo. Bitcoin doesn't have the 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 you know Bitcoin's uh, doesn't have the 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 very rapid transactions. Well, that's not true now with Lightning, but there's a lot of BS that's thrown at Bitcoin about that. And it's like, look, thank God we're early enough where all of these things are not fleshed out already. That means that we're early, and opportunity is not big. When everything is already done. Do you understand this, people? Do you understand that it's a blessing that it's not done yet? That means there's so much more upside. But are you going to sit and wait for every I to be dotted and every T to be crossed and perfection to be already established? And now that's when you invest in it? That's when you do it? That's stupid. That's not where the opportunity is. The opportunity is before it's finished. Just think of real estate. Before it's done. Before the building's complete. Before there's a structure. Before there's a blueprint. Do you want to get in early? And we're early. We're still doing things at the base layer. And we're starting to do things at layer two, which is the lightning layer. Then there will be a layer three, and then there will be a layer four, and then there will be a layer five. The other thing I will say about that is that as you go up the layers, there are trade-offs. So as you go up the layers, the base layer gets more expensive, gets more rare to use. You use the cash in your pocket and the credit card in your wallet far more frequently than you use your vaults. You want it that way. So what's more secure, the cash in your pocket or the vault? Which one should be more expensive, the vault to access? The cash in your pocket should be the least expensive to access. So just like someone can steal the money in your wallet easier than they can steal the money in your vault. The cost to access your vault should be higher than the cost to access the 10 or 15 or $50 in your pocket. You want it to be that way. Otherwise, it won't be secure. You want the cost to access your entire life's work to be low? Really? That's what you want? All of these ideas come from not understanding how money works. And this is on purpose. It's on purpose that our children are not taught about money. It's on purpose that you weren't taught about money. It's on purpose that you can spend $250,000 for a higher education and not learn one thing about money. Which freaking makes the world go around. There are a very small percentage of people that truly understand how the financial system works, how money works, how it's in layers, how it's supposed to evolve over four different stages. Very few people understand money, yet you give your life for money. Everybody and almost everybody on planet Earth wants more money, yet how many people on planet Earth have studied money? How many people know money's history? They want it. They work for it. They do everything in their life for money. But the numbers of people who've sat down and said, I want money. Let me study money. Almost nobody. How intelligent is that? The thing that you give your life to, the thing that you spend your life doing until the day you die, you've never studied. 99% of the, how many people do I have here? 
Let me get the number right now. I'm going to tell you this. There are, oh, I don't know, 20 people here. Oh, 57 plus others. Okay, so let's say there's 70 people here. Out of 70, 80 people here, guess what percentage of these people here, yes, that's you, have actually sat down and studied money, studied its history, studied all the past forms of money, how they came about, how they, how they eventually went out. How many of you have done that? I can tell you the percentage. I can tell you no more than 8%. And that's generous. I know these numbers. And I'm telling you, it's no more than 8% of the people on planet Earth that's actually studied money. And that's generous. Because it's something you have to do on your own. It's something that you're taught to accept. You're taught to accept the definition of money. You're taught to assign the title of money to something that doesn't even fit the definition of money. Money can't be something that a human being issues issued. It never has been that way in history. If you study money throughout the ages, it's never been created by a human being. Money throughout all of the human experience has never been created by a human being. Never until now. So why now? Why is money, why, why have we been tricked to call something money that has never met the definition of money in the entire human experience? Go look, go delve, delve into this a little bit and you'll find money has never been in the domain of a human being. Until recently, fiat currency, man-made, man-controlled, man controls the issuance, man controls the supply, and man controls the price. This is a brand new experiment in the entire multi-million year human experience. This is just a few years old. And guess what? It's failing miserably. U.S. dollar down 98.9% since 1913. That's a success. <laughs> That's what you call a success. Down 98.9%. That's a failure. And it's a modern failure. And it's because of this lack of understanding of what money is, its history, and how it has always evolved for human beings, and how it's never been something that a human being was supposed to control. You understand the beauty of Bitcoin, that it's brought the purity of money back. It is not in the hands of any human being. It is not controlled by a human being. Its issuance is not in the hands of a human being. Its supply is not in the hands of a human being. It actually does the reverse. It pays human beings to work for it. I want you to think about that. <laughs> think about that. We work for money. We work for the fake money. All right? but. Bitcoin pays human beings to work for it. That's freaking insane. Think about the fact that not a single human being is running this. And just if you sit with that thought, you start to really understand how special this is. Wait a minute. No human being is running it. It's running by what? By itself? Is it running by another being that we don't know of? Like this thing is running without human intervention. It is paying its own army. It has laid out a pay scale, just like a company does. It says, this is my pay scale. It's laid out its pay scale for the human race all the way to 2140. And it's saying, it's dictating the terms and saying, you're going to work. This is what I'm paying you. And you will receive this for defending me, for securing me, and for protecting me.
you're my army. That's the miners. It doesn't force anybody to work for it. It has just laid out its schedule and said, anybody on earth can work for me and I will pay them to defend me, to protect me. This is a freaking living entity. Do you understand? It grows every 10 minutes. How is that not living? Every 10 minutes, it adds a new cell to its being, a new block. It is conscious through the difficulty adjustment. So it consciously adjusts its difficulty by how many miners are plugged in to the network. So if too many, if too many miners unplug, it makes itself easier to work for, to bring them back. That's not conscious. That's not being a living freaking entity. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have enough miners. Let me adjust. It adjusts with no human into No human being is switching and saying, oh, wait, according to my clipboard here, um, we need more miners. All by itself, without a human being doing a single thing, it adjusts itself and says, come back, miners. And when there's two And when there's too many miners, it makes itself more difficult. It's freaking crazy. Every 10 minutes, it becomes stronger, more exponentially more secure, longer, taller, more powerful. It grows just like your child grows. It consciously adjusts itself through its difficulty rate. It pays human beings. It has human beings fighting over each other, tripping over each other to work for it. Countries are now scrambling to give its resources to it, to feed it. This is a freaking living thing. It's crazy when you think about it. And that's the more esoteric view, which... You start to go down um, as you go deeper and deeper down the down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And so you can imagine if I think about Bitcoin this way, how silly I think about someone who just regards it as this is another financial product. Are you freaking kidding me? What other financial product does what I just explained? Are Like, what's your IQ, dude? How? How is that another financial product? It's crazy. Wow. Um, Fees will rise on the base layer, which will force innovation and development on higher layers that that are cheaper. And that's what you want. And all the layers on top of the base layer will ultimately, over time, be built out. And there will be a layer that will be practically nothing to move around. There'll be trade-offs on that level where it won't be as secure as your vault. But you don't need the most secure vault to do certain things in your life. You don't need the base layer. You don't just like you don't need to access the vault that holds the vast majority of your wealth every for everyday things. So the money in your pocket walking down the street is not as secure as the money in your vault, but it's still useful. The trade-off is it's not as safe. It's not as secure. It can be more easily stolen from me because it's on my person. But it's useful to have some there. And that's the way the Bitcoin network's going to be. You're going to have this layer that's not as secure as the base layer, but it's not as safe as the base layer, but it's safe enough to do the small things on that level. Just like the money in your pocket. Money in your vault can't be stolen, but the money in your pocket can. But still, you want some money in your pocket. And so these trade-offs are going to be there on the different levels. Gordon says, my brokerage account feels less and less important the deeper down the Bitcoin rabbit hole I go. Certainly happened to me. 
Gordon. Um, should I bite the bullet, sell it all, and throw it into Bitcoin? Well, listen, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't tell you what to do. I don't know your family. I don't know your circumstances. And even if I did, I probably am not equipped to tell you what to do in your life. I don't know your dreams, your aspirations, what you're looking for. I don't know your commitment to this. I don't know your level of of knowledge regarding Bitcoin. You know, there's so, so many different moving parts, and I could never give you personal advice. But what I will say is what I said earlier in our session here today, the deeper your conviction, the higher the percentage you will go. And the world is moving to a 100% Bitcoin standard. It's happening before our very eyes. And you either have eyes to see that or you don't. But it's happening, and it's only a matter of time before people start pricing things in Bitcoin and seeing how everything goes towards zero against Bitcoin. So why hold other things? So I'm not saying that people won't have real estate. No, people are going to have real estate, but real estate is going to be used more for its utility purposes and not as an alternative Bitcoin. I used real estate because there was no Bitcoin. I had properties all over the place just to store and hold value so that it wouldn't go down. Do you understand? So now I have Bitcoin for that. So I don't need those things. I don't need the headaches of taxes, accountants, maintenance, tenants, lawsuits, um, insurance. I don't need that. I can just put it in Bitcoin and it blows what I was using that for away. So now I reduce my ownership of these properties for that. And now they just become useful for, uh, they become useful just for their utility. I'm not saying that people are never going to own a stock anymore. But it's going to be because of a more special purpose and not because I got to become a stock expert because otherwise I, I'm just going to become poorer. Like most people are playing the stock market because they have to, not because they want to. Because they're told to. If you want to stay ahead, you got to put some money here. It's by coercion. The corrupt system has coerced them to become freaking stock experts when that's not even what they really want to do. And they've been taught that that's being smart. Um, so people are going to, over time, invest in a company that is doing something that they're passionate about. It might be a company that's doing something special for Bitcoin that you want to invest in. And you're going to invest in and own a piece of this company or a piece of the stock or whatever. Like that is not going to go away. I'm just saying that people are not just going to be using it. Like how many grandmothers are in mutual funds and ETFs and they don't, they don't really want to do that. They have to. We don't have to anymore. Just throw it in Bitcoin. You don't have to be an expert to store in Bitcoin. You don't have to become a freaking stock expert. You don't have to be a freaking take courses to become a real estate mogul to invest in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to simplify that whole process. Just put, if you don't need it now, put it there. Period. No PE ratios and what's the new product line coming out? And what's the competition doing? You think the average person wants to be dealing with that? Do you think the average person should be dealing with that? Because that's what the system has taught you that you should be a stock expert. This should be a specialty for a small number of people on planet Earth. Um, 
Naturally, being only five years into my investment career, there's a voice in my head saying, what if I'm wrong? You mean, what if Bitcoin is wrong? What if you're wrong about Bitcoin? Well, that just, that just requires more. You can't do that, Gordon, unless you get to a place where you know Bitcoin's not wrong. So like I said, your level of commitment is exactly in proportion to the level of your understanding. If you're doubting that, you're not quite at the understanding, and and maybe some people never get there, but you're not quite at the understanding that Bitcoin is math. So how can it ever fail? Like, how can... One plus one stop equaling two. How can Tuesday stop coming after Monday? When you see Bitcoin that way, well, how can this fail? It's maths. How? How how can mathematics fail? It can't. How how can it? How can 0.5% go down from here? Do you see what's happening? It's not going down from here. So if 0.5% is not going down and it's only going up, how can it fail? If every four years, no one can stop Bitcoin's issuance from being halved and the 0.5% can't is not going down, it's only going up, how is it possible for it to fail? It can't. Bitcoin's years where it was possible to fail, they're long gone. The cat is out of the bag. You can't stop it. I can't remember the person's name, but there was someone high up, high, very high up in the um, Obama administration who basically m- men said this about Bitcoin. And I'm going to summarize because I don't know the exact quote or the words. We should have killed it when it was a baby. Now it's too late. It was too late in the Obama administration. Do you realize this? They acknowledged it. You can search this if you think I'm playing with you. I'm not. That the Obama administration admitted we should have killed Bitcoin when it was a baby. Now it's too late. This is the freaking president of the most powerful country in the world saying it's too late. The years of stopping this are long gone, guys. You're not going to stop it. It's not going to stop growing. It's not going from 0.5% to less than 0.5%. It's going to one. It's going to three. It's going to five. It's going to do what the internet did on steroids. Why? Because this is now the internet of money. We had the internet of information. Now the spirit of the internet has just now moved to money and it's manifested itself through this entity called Bitcoin. It's the same spirit. It's just moved to a different body now called Bitcoin. And now it's, it, 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 it tackled information and knowledge. It digitized all of that. Now it's digitizing money. It's just moving like a freaking cloud that's now, okay, I, I, I handle this now. Let me move over here. They'll call me something different. They called me the internet over here. Now they're going to call me Bitcoin, but I'm the same thing moving from item to item, information, knowledge, money. And if you understand that, you'll see the same thing that happened to your photos, right? My mother used to have Four albums she would bore the neighbors with every time they came over once a year for coffee, forgetting that she showed them the same four albums of my baby pictures. And I'd say, Ma, you showed that to them last year. And she'd be like, just be quiet, boy. They didn't see this one. They didn't see you playing baseball when you were three. They didn't see you playing the piano when you were two. They didn't see these. I got new ones. And she would pull out the same four photo albums. Do you know on my phone, I've got 50,000 photos in one phone and I've got four of them. And they give me just as much joy as the physical ones my mom used to have under the coffee table. 
digitized. I've got 2,200 books across my phones and my different Kindles. 2,200 books digitized. Music. I can't tell you the last time I touched a vinyl record or seen an album cover that I could hold in my hands. But I've got access to billions of songs. Billions. I can't touch them. I can't see them. I can't feel them. But I get joy from them. This spirit of digitizing your life. There are people who have digital friends that are more valuable than the actual physical people they can feel, touch, and see every day in their lives. Some of you have more special relationships digitally than you have actually. You are closer to some people you've never met in your entire life. You've never touched them. You've never looked into their eyes, but you've got a special relationship with them. Your friends are digital. Some people are in love with people that they've never met before. Digital. Everything goes to the immaterial. There was a time in the human experience where gods were physical. They were trinkets. They were little dolls. They were statues. They People worshipped the weather. They worshipped a certain mountain. They worshipped a certain tree. They worshipped and prayed to a certain river. And that has moved to immaterial God. They can't be touched, felt, seen. The most valuable things in your life today are immaterial. They cannot be touched. They cannot be seen. They cannot be felt. When's the last time you've touched justice or fairness or honesty? Have you ever looked into the eyes of honesty? You might have looked into the eyes of someone who was honest who had honesty, but you've never seen honesty. You've never felt honesty. You, The things that we value the most, you can't touch or see or feel or hold or possess. That's Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the epitome of value that cannot be touched, felt, which means it's the highest form of value because you can't touch it. And because you can't touch it, feel it, see it, or hold it. It's evasive to human frailty. Humans can't ruin it because they can't touch it. Humans can't corrupt it because they can't feel it or hold it or possess it. They can't fuck it up because it's not in the physical world. And our entire existences are being sucked into the physical world. Your books are in the physical world now. Your photos are in the physical world now. Or are no longer in the physical world, I mean. Your photos have been sucked from the physical world to the digital world. Your books have been sucked into the digital world from the physical world. Your music has been sucked there. Some of your friendships have been sucked there. Your movies have gone there. Do you see how the digital world is pulling more and more of your life into it? But we never thought that in this brand new world, this new frontier, that there was ever something called scarcity. That how can something be scarce in the digital realm? Because you can copy it. How can an email that I can copy over and over again be limited in supply? How can a photo have scarcity in the digital world when the person I sent it to gets it and I still have it? And that person can copy it an un- infinite number of times. We never thought thought that in this world that we are being sucked into, that there was something called scarcity there. We knew scarcity existed in some form or another in the physical world, but we never thought it was possible or it existed there until Satoshi Nakamoto put some some 
some contraption together. He used this from this person and that from that person, just like a freaking master chef. He took things that had existed for a long time and put them together in the most unique way. And boom, this discovered, did not create, discovered that yes, there is scarcity in this new frontier, in this new world, in this new America. We never knew that it existed here until Satoshi Nakamoto said, yeah, here it is. It does here. And Bitcoin is the manifestation of scarcity in this new world that we now are living more and more of our lives in. And so that kicked off a brand new era in a brand new world. Scarcity, value in the digital world is expressed through Bitcoin. And as our lives become more sucked into this new world, if you don't adopt the thing of value there, you will die. You will not be able to survive in that world without the thing of value in that world. Nothing else in that world really has value except Bitcoin because you can copy it. The only thing in the new world that you can't copy is Bitcoin. That's what makes it special. All right, guys, I think I've talked enough. What time is it? How long have I been talking? Oh, my. Are you kidding me? How long is this thing? It's after midnight. So my title was correct. Midnight Bitcoin Q&A with Oliver Velez. <laughs> guys, listen, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry I didn't get to all of your questions, but uh, I do want to kind of do this somewhat regularly. Um, it allows me to just kind of go off on a tangent sometimes. I hope you don't mind that. Um, keep in mind, guys, that every single time I'm doing this, I do record them. It does wind up on Bitcoin Unleashed. Find that podcast, Spotify, Fountain App, uh, YouTube, wherever. Just find it. Make sure you follow it there. Um, I believe that what we're talking about here today will increasingly become more and more valuable as time go, goes along. And I want you to use some of those past talks, some of those past episodes to keep yourself motivated, to shore up some of the doubts you might have um, so that you stay the course. I think it's important that we stay the course. All right, guys, once again, thank you for giving me your time. You know what to do. Go to work. Stack harder. And until next time, ciao My for now. Oliver Velez, and I am your 13%er Bitcoiner. Be safe out there. And until next time, boom!